want to introduce Nancy. Nancy Connors is a student in Phil Schultz's master class and a teacher at Writer Studio. Her work has appeared in Midwest Poetry Review, Passenger, Poetry Motel, and other publications, and she's a wonderful fiction writer. Welcome, Nancy. I'm going to read uh, the beginning of a story called uh, In the Event Your Identity is Stolen. I didn't drag my ass home from work until after nine because we were handling the fallout from this whole identity theft problem. Some actuary in our Philadelphia office hadn't encrypted his data, and about 50,000 people were getting some bad news. My team was working the phones hard, offering the victims a complimentary one-year subscription to a credit monitoring company, <laughs> plus a link to a completely useless brochure someone in PR had ginned up called In the Event Your Identity is Stolen, <laughs> and which we on the front lines called Dude, You're Screwed. <laughs> things, weren't, things weren't going well. First, we had to wear these yellow polo shirts that said Team Fix It on the back of the <laughs> This was the white hot idea of our boss, Nick, who somehow couldn't foresee that this would become Team Fuck It to everyone. <laughs> Second, it turns out that when people are upset, they don't want to hear an actuarial explanation about the infinitesimal probability of their data being compromised. And they really don't want you to say that you have no idea whether they'll be financially ruined or be declared legally dead. I hadn't heard as many fuck yous since college when I had a job selling magazine subscriptions by phone. The worst, though, was this poor brat guy who immigrated from the Ukraine. He started sobbing and asking me if he should change his name. I can only imagine why this struck him as a viable solution. Sir, I said, reading from the script, I am not authorized to tell you how to best handle your personal situation beyond offering you a no-cost opportunity for one full year to be notified in the unlikely event that someone has used your information or attempted to use it to obtain credit in your name. Will someone take everything from me? It occurred to me that he was asking a pretty damned universal question, but I had to move on. I was still sobbing when I disconnected. I felt bad doing it. Sort of bad, anyhow. The guy had turned into something of a pain in the ass with all the crying. Anyhow, we had a quota of 20 calls an hour, three minutes per call. I did sign him up for the credit monitoring service, though. To keep us working through lunch, the company provided a hot meal, baked ziti, chicken parm, the works. Those of us who stayed late got pizza for dinner, and management was holding out the vague promise of bonuses once it was all over. But still, it was a bad gig, making meaningless assurances to 50,000 pissed off people. It was kind of like lying without actually lying but still lying. <laughs> After two weeks of it, my already borderline alcohol consumption had ju jumped into full-blown drinking problem mode, but it was just wine, so not that bad. <laughs> my husband, Bear, was a rock. By the time I stumbled into the house, he fed and bathed Chloe and Mandy. Unfortunately, Bear had been out of work for nine months, fired for routinely missing his quota of subprime mortgage sales. He seemed to be settling a little too deeply into the domestic bliss of caring for two little kids who spent most of the day at school. But still, he was there, and he knew how to wrangle a, a dinner of chicken nuggets and celery sticks and transform a load of dirty clothes into something resembling normalcy. I plopped down on the living room sofa. I could hear the girls upstairs in the Barbie pit the space between their beds, arguing over whose Barbie would get to wear the only pair of pink stilettos. You would think that Chloe, who was seven and older, would naturally prevail, but she had a soft heart and gave up, gave up easily, while Mandy, at five, wanted what she wanted. Bear handed me a glass of Chardonnay. Your sister called like five times, said you weren't answering your cell, said you should call her as soon as you walked in. I told her it would be late. Is anything wrong? I asked, and we both laughed a little. Something was always wrong with Linda. It was only a question of how wrong. Ever since we'd been little, Linda had found trouble wherever she went. It was like she needed it to survive. She was in the ER so often for broken bones, stitches, 
and once a concussion. The mom was on a first name basis with the nurses. Later, the hospital trips were for overdoses and alcohol poisoning, and even later, for inpatient psych stays. At school, she was Looney Linda, and I was the crazy girl's dull little sister. <laughs> Looney Linda was exciting and fun. She stirred anarchy in the classroom, yelled out comments about anything and everything, sold mini bottles of vodka at lunch, <laughs> and spent significant portions of her high school career in in-school suspension. Finally, a psychiatrist laid it out. Borderline personality disorder compounded by self-medication. He said that one day she might grow out of it. People did, but, she didn't, but he didn't look too hopeful, and so far, no dice. She was still Looney Linda, and when she was in trouble, she called me. So tonight, would I just listen to her for an hour until she dozed off, or would I get her an emergency admit someplace and spend several hours getting her settled in? There was no question that at least some of what was wrong with her right now was my fault. I knew that. And if I've ever forgot, she always reminded me. You and Bear stole my baby away from me. You stole Chloe. Bear ran his fingers through my hair while I dialed Linda's cell. I need to get someplace, Jordy. I could hear her taking long drags from her cigarette and sighing the smoke out. I need to go now. Every small joy at being home flew away when I heard her voice. Okay, hon, okay, but why didn't you tell Bear? He could have helped you. Because he's a useless piece of shit. <laughs> I took that punch for the team, nodded to myself, and slugged the wine. So far, we were following the usual script. Chloe appeared in front of me, in my silk and lace half slip, just as I was about to ask Linda if she was cutting herself. The slip's waistband was pulled up under Chloe's armpits. She had apparently decided it was her new nightgown. She had let her sister play hair salon, and her hair was now so knotted with rubber bands and gel that she'd probably need a haircut, <laughs> a very short haircut. <laughs> Who is it, she mouthed. Aunt Linda, I mouthed back and blew her a kiss. Chloe wrinkled her nose like something smelled bad. Have you been taking your meds, I said to Linda. Chloe rolled her eyes at me and trudged back upstairs. She knew the drill, too, and that fact kind of killed me. They're not working. Linda was lying, of course. Sometimes I suspected that she cut back on her nuts because she needed the drama that a full-blown episode brought, when it could be all about her and her needs, as she called them, which sometimes prompted Bear and me to talk about our needs. I have needs that aren't being met, I'd say to Bear as I was doing the bills. I need a bazillion dollars. I have needs too. I need a massage with a happy ending. I need unconditional dinner on the table every night. We'd always been good at amusing ourselves at Linda's expense. It helped. How's Mandy? Linda never asked about Chloe, although she seemed glad enough whenever she saw her. I guess asking about her was either too painful or she wanted me to think it was too painful. I wasn't sure. Both girls are good. So can you get us on a three-way call with Dr. Anspot? Suddenly Linda was all business, which made me think this was a fake cry for help. When they were real, she couldn't make a decision. She could barely even talk. Are you sure you wouldn't rather come here for the night, see how you feel in the morning? Barry filled my glass and shook his head no. Please, no Linda in the house. <laughs> I narrowed my eyes and gave him my don't mess with me look. Mandy started shouting from upstairs that I should come sing her a song. My text bell was dinging. My boss, Nick, wondering whether I would be willing to come in the next day, a Saturday. No pressure, but we could use the help, followed by every happy and begging emoji available, <laughs> including an eggplant, which I decided to <laughs> assume was a mistake. <laughs> Linda sighed. Okay, I'll come to your place, but you have to get me. My car isn't working. I wanted to say again, but there was no point. Okay, let me tuck the girls in. I'll be by in an hour. Linda hung up. I used to get mad about that, thinking she was hanging up on me to be a bitch. But after a while, I realized that she just did it because she was done with the conversation. I clicked off and looked at Bear, who was trying to stare me down. We owe her. I gave him the look again. Jordy, we don't owe her anything. She owes us. Call her back and say no. We've gone through this a million times, and nothing about it ever changed. 
It was just one endless soul-sucking shit show that made working at Team Fix-It feel like a foot massage. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, I'm wiped out. Can you make up the sofa for her and I'll say goodnight to the girls? Oh, and Nick the Prick wants me back in tomorrow. On a Saturday, Jordy really, Bear turned his back to me in disgust and slumped back into the kitchen. Now I felt guilty about all of the following. Getting home too late to spend time with the girls, working on a Saturday, all the ways I'd been shitty to Linda, not saying no to Linda, and hanging up on the Ukrainian guy. Oh, and neglecting to call, tell Chloe that unfortunately, Aunt Linda was her mother. And as if that wasn't complicated enough, that Bear was indeed her father. Like I said, it was a shit show, and one that we created all by ourselves. It occurred to me, not for the first time, that I could just get in my car and drive away. <laughs> I could probably make it to the middle of Wisconsin on half a tank of gas, find a single room somewhere, and get a job at a cheese hut selling fried curds. <laughs> I'd have a uniform and everything. All my problems solved. <laughs> I shook off the fantasy and went in to say goodnight to the girls. I noticed that they had removed all the heads from the Barbies, Skippers, and Kens and put them back on the wrong torso. <laughs> Ken was dressed in a hookerish red cotton <laughs> and a Barbie in a bush cowboy outfit. The Barbie pit had become a hotbed of identity confusion. <laughs>